Welcome to the craft and biz of acting, the place to go to learn what they didn't teach you in acting school. When you're looking for the next step in your acting career, we've got you covered. With your host, monologue expert and founder of monologues2go.com, Joyce Story. Hello, fellow thespians. You are listening to the craft and biz of acting. I'm your host, Joyce Story, and we're here to explore the nuts and bolts of auditioning and performing. I happen to live on one of the best blocks in Manhattan. We have the best neighbors anywhere. And today's guest is my friend and neighbor, Andrea Prestonario. Andrea is an award-winning actress, singer, and activist who is New York City-based and Chicago-grown. She's currently working at Baltimore Center Stage in Fun Home, playing Allison. She's played the same role at Weston Playhouse. Other regional credits include Sarah Brown in Guys and Dolls, Eliza in My Fair Lady at Oslo Rep with director Frank Galati, Martha in 1776, also with director Frank Galati at ACT San Francisco, Maureen in Rent, and Eliza in My Fair Lady at Paramount Theater Aurora, Gertie in Oklahoma at Lyric Opera Chicago, Louise in Gypsy, Curtains, Sugar, and Seven Brides for Seven Brothers at Drury Lane Oak Brook, Oak Howard, and Violet in Sideshow at Boho Theatre Company, where she won the Jeff Award for Leading Actress. Andrea has performed her solo show, Smoky Town, The Songs of Smokey Robinson, at Lori Beachman, Main Stage Chicago, and Feinstein's 54 Below, and will have upcoming performances at Beverly Arts Center Chicago and Metropolis Arlington Heights Arts Center. She is co-founder of Ring of Keys, a national network of queer women and TGNC artists working in musical theater. You can find more about Andrea at andreaprestonario.com or at Andrea Prestonario. And welcome to the show, Andrea. Hi. Hi. Thank you for that introduction. I could have shortened my bio a bit, I guess, huh? Well, that's okay. We got it all in. And that's just... You got every credit listed. I hey, love it. Listen, you know what? If you've got them, let's just think about it. Good for you. <laughs> I am just so darn proud of you. Every time I see you, you're busy on your way to or from something that you booked, which is just wonderful. I remember you had that great uh, Subway ad. Tell me about that. Yeah, I had a, a Subway campaign ad, which means like it was uh, it was an ad for uh, Just Works Company, which is like uh, an HR for small businesses. And it was plastered all over the subways for a good month or two. It was really fun to walk in and see my face. It was called, it was boss face was my, was the, the idea that they were going for. Like, you don't want to put on your boss face. You need just works to help you. And the first time I walked in on the subway and I saw my face, oh I was feeling and taking photos. And, and of course, like typical New Yorkers, everyone just sort of never looked up from their newspapers or phones. <laughs> <laughs> that is such typical New Yorkers because you see all sorts of all sorts of crazy on the subway. So you just uh, nothing yeah, head down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's not particularly crazy. That's just pretty darn cool, I think. Yeah, it was pretty cool. And I heard you had like people that were taking selfies, popping up and putting it on your social media. Yeah, I capitalized on it. I, I, I was I was requesting selfies from friends and people really, they took it and ran with it. So I had all kinds of friends sending selfies and I made a little like video out of all of those photos of people making their best boss face face next to me. <laughs> How fun. How fun. Yeah, it was fun. Wow. And speaking of fun, you're now doing Fun Home playing I, Allison. Yeah, I am um, getting the chance to Reprise this role, um, consecutive yet separate productions of Fun Home for myself. I did it this summer, as you mentioned, in Vermont at Weston Playhouse. And now I'm getting a chance to do it at Baltimore Center Stage. And it's a total, it's a, it's a role that I just didn't, I didn't think would come to, come to my plate this soon. And I'm just so glad to be able to give credence to a, a, a role and, and, and a woman who I just admire and respect so much, which is Alison Bechtel. I find it so fascinating that you're doing the roles back to back. You just finished. How long since you did it the last time? I finished the last week of July. And, you know, it's funny. I actually, I did two consecutive yet separate productions of My Fair Lady back a number of years ago. And those productions were only two weeks apart. Oh, my gosh. That, I have some experience in doing a role a second time. And it's kind of, it's, an, it's a different process 
you end up the second time around spending time unlearning things. You get to sort you're not sort of starting from scratch, right? I think it would be a disservice to the resources, the dramaturgical resources that you've been able to compile. You wouldn't want to scrap all of that. So you, you don't necessarily start from scratch, but you sort of, I think of it as like, you know, molding clay and you're kind of trying to start as fresh as possible because you have brand new collaborators and brand new opportunities for new choices. And I'm so, so, so excited to work with Hana Sharif, who is directing this production. She is the Associate Artistic Director here at Baltimore Center Stage, but this is actually her final show here because she's been named the Artistic Director of the Rep in St. Louis, and she's making history when she takes that assignment as the first Black woman Artistic Director in the country ever, which is so amazing. So... Yeah, really cool. That's exciting. Uh, Yeah, she's an inspiring, warm, creative human. And I'm just so excited to play and be in the room with her. Um, We've just only begun the process. So I'm really eager and excited for what the next two, three weeks hold. Right. I find it interesting that you said you're unlearning things. I didn't think about that. If you do a role again, you have to kind of check at the door your preconceived notion of who this person is and explore them all over again. Yeah, I think it's about being open to, like you said, a new vision, new collaborators. And I mean, notes are notes that those won't change. But the way in which we interpret notes on a page, musical notes, that is, may shift based on the way that we're influenced by our co-star, for instance, right? Right. So I think the goal, and at least in my experience and and what I'm trying to do in this production is to just stay open and present and malleable as I can. Right. But you must feel more in your bones the second time around. with Absolutely. Yeah. You definitely get to walk in with a little more confidence. That's for sure. You already, you know, the scope, you know, the track, you know, the journey the character is going to take. So I think a a lot of times when you start a production, you don't know what it's going to feel on like on you. You don't know what that, that, journey of the scope of your production will feel like. I know how difficult this role is emotionally. I know what it is I have to prepare for emotionally, but um, you don't necessarily know that the first time around when you're first in rehearsals. Plus you're off book already. So you, you have the script and the score. Really yeah. Well I, in your body. Yeah. Except that I, I kind of, I go back to the source material. So I'm, I'm, I'm back to, I'm starting with the script that they handed me here. I'm starting fresh, you know, new lines to highlight and look at and revisit, so to speak, instead of just playing from muscle memory right. and thinking that, oh, I, I know this already. So I am revisiting it and trying to really look at those lines and not think of them as already memorized. But that's the sign of a good actor, because I know this already isn't in your vocabulary ever. (laughs) (laughs) It seems like you have worked a lot in your career in regional theater. It seems like work begets work. If you've just finished coming off of this show and now you're doing it again, I would guess that it had a lot to do with you getting cast this time around. I would think so. I mean, I certainly haven't had, nor don't think I will have that conversation with the creative team and in and, and that they would say, oh, it was because of your experience. And sometimes, you know, I mean, actors know this, that sometimes having done the role works against you. Right. Some directors really want someone that they can really feel like they can mold and doesn't already have preconceived notions or doesn't already know the, the track, I guess. But I would think that it's a fit too. I mean, regardless of whether I had done it already, it, it's a role that it, that fits in me. So it, I'm right for it in a way. Yeah. So you've worked in all sorts of places. You've had a really great career in regional theater. You're based in New York, but you travel a lot and you're willing to travel a lot. That's not a problem for you. Oh yeah, not a problem. I love traveling. I love when when a job brings me to a new city and I get to explore that city for the first time. Um, that's kind of, I mean, that's been most of my experiences. I hadn't been to Vermont until I stepped foot in that state for the for the job. I hadn't been to San Francisco until I stepped foot in to that city for that job. I think that's one of the really wonderful gifts that you receive as an actor is you get to go so many cool places and so many adventures and it's never boring ever. Um, 
Yeah, it's never boring. But uh, yeah, I have had I, I, I haven't had the opportunity yet to do a national tour, but that is on my bucket list. And that is a goal to be able to really travel in that sense. Right. I have had the opportunity to work a lot of great places and uh, I've been able to build up a, a really large resume. I worked in Chicago for eight years after graduating from college. So I worked primarily primarily in Chicago for the first eight years. So the le- regional work has actually only been, beyond Chicago, I should say, has only really been in the last six years. You've really made tracks in six years. I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> And you're not afraid to leave New York, which I think is really wonderful because you know how a lot of people feel like, oh, if I leave New York, I'm missing something. Do you feel that? Yeah, I know that that's a thing. I don't know. I mean, you know, my girlfriend, Clea, and I, we we both feel the same way where we just like go where the work is. And I don't know why you would sit around in New York waiting for, I don't know why you would not work to stay put to not work. I don't know. Yes. Just, it makes no sense, does it? Yeah. But Unless I know a lot of people do have that feeling. You know, the second you go to the airport is always when the phone rings and some casting director or agent wants you for something. Yeah, I've never, I've never been that person, and I've always wanted to make sure I was mobile enough. Like I've never wanted children, and I, I don't really, I don't want things that tie me down, and I want to be able to be mobile and, and go where the work is, and that is the priority. So, but I think too, because you're willing to go. And and you're going to good places. It's not like these aren't good houses. These are all fantastic. Oh, yeah. But you're also, you're expanding your craft as an actor. Every time you do a show, you become a better actor. And you are putting on your resume what casting directors and agents are looking for, which is work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's very true. I mean, there's this feeling that you have in or I mean because obviously I'm in New York because I want to be on Broadway that is the goal that's why I moved to New York and it does feel this there's this catch 22 a lot of the times of like well, you can't get a Broadway show unless you have a Broadway credit but you can't get that Broadway credit <laughs> unless you have a Broadway show and I guess you can just hope that work will continue to be get work and somehow you'll get in the right room at the right time and opportunity will arise what is that saying? I'm trying to think of it. Oh, it's the intersection of um, when craft meets opportunity. Oh, right. Yeah. Well, so I am just fascinated by the fact that you're a working actor. You don't have a day job at this point, right? Or a survival job? I don't. I actually, I did have a survival job in New York for in and out of four years. I was working as a financial analyst at Lincoln Center, actually. Really? Yeah. It was a, it was a temp job turned salaried and at the time I all along from the from day one I was they knew I was an actor and they knew I needed flexibility and that was sort of always the priority and I just was determined to prove to them that I would work hard in exchange for that flexibility and I had a boss that really valued artists and she is just such a gift because she she rolled my temp position into a salary position while, while I still had flexibility to audition when I needed to. And I think that that's the only way to make it work in New York. I mean, it's so expensive and you have to make enough to pay your bills, but there's this time money ratio that is like so impossible in New York, unless you have a benefactor or a trust fund, um, a wealthy spouse that can support you. It, it's, it's so impossible. And those first two years in New York for me were so hard and it was just hemorrhaging money. And I was working like three part-time jobs and still not making the, enough money to pay my rent and just so difficult. And when I landed this Lincoln Center temp job, it just, from that moment on, everything kind of changed for me. Once I had that full-time salary job while still being able to audition, I had enough resources to be able to take class then to get new headshots because I had the money I was make I had a foundation I had I could meet my basic expenses and things just started to really roll from there I did in that four years I did leave a couple times for regional productions too but amazingly they were let me come back to the job when I would come back to town so as of now I'm no longer working there but I um I'm on to the next chapter so Wonderful. Wonderful. I want to talk a little more about that, but first we have to take a break from our sponsor, and we'll be right back. 
Looking for the perfect monologue that will nail your next audition? Need something right away? Need a fresh perspective? Monologues2go.com is your one-stop shop for audition material. We understand actors' needs because we've been in your shoes. We know the importance of finding the perfect piece that fits like it was made for you. Pick your favorite monologues and download them instantly. It's that easy. Think of us like a takeout menu, only a whole lot more fun. We're fresh, fast, hot, and delivered to you in seconds. monologues to gocom Original monologues that work. We are back with Andrea Prestonario. And Andrea, I want to talk a little more about that first two years in New York you said that was so difficult. And it's oh. really interesting that you were in the financial world. Most people think that every actor is waiting table somewhere. But you found a really good balance for yourself. I did. Well, I did at, at year three. The first two years were, um, were not yet Lincoln Center. Um, the first two years were the, um, just babysitting and whatnot and just little hobnob personal assistant jobs and little just trying to cobble up enough money to make the rent. But it is bizarre to be in the financial world, um, although it was at a performing arts organization. So it was sort of under the umbrella of a nonprofit and not so much like Wall Street financial world. But you but, persevered. You said the first two years were yeah. really tough. What made you keep your focus and your eye on the ball? You know, I had moments where I said, I don't think the city is for me. I, I, I can't do this. Oh, my God, it's so impossible. And I just couldn't imagine taking all my stuff and packing it up and, and turning around. That to me felt too overwhelming. So all I knew how to do was just keep going. And I just had this strength and, and belief system that it was just going to get better. Um, I know it sounds kind of corny, but I just, I just kept fighting. And, you know, there were money is money. I mean, there are moments when it feels insurmountable to overcome, but I think it's easier too for me to sit here years later and re reflect on it. But it, because in the moment, it definitely felt very scary and real. But um, I think I think having support of family and friends helped to, you know, to have to tell me to keep going too. I, I still have a note that my dad sent me framed on my desk. It says, you have to keep going. Hard work will get you success. Wow. Don't give up. Uh, I love your dad already. That's, yeah, that's really great. I mean, to have that kind of support system. And I think it is important to have that support system, especially when you're breaking into a new market. Oh, yeah, it was super scary. I mean, I think if I look back on it, I don't, I don't, I don't think I actually knew what I was getting into. And I don't think you could ever know, you don't really know until you're in it. And you're walking the walk and talking the talk, you really can't know, but it, it did get better. You said something that I think is important. You said that once you stabilized your financial situation, everything got better after that. It did. It was like everything locked in at year three for me. Once I finally had a foundation and I was making enough to meet my fixed expenses, I also around this time settled into a relationship and we found a home, the home that we live on, on the same street as you. Yay. And we were able to really, I was, everything kind of solidified and I, I built, I had roots, I had a, a foundation and, you know, a home is so important in New York. It is. It really is a safe space and a, a Zen space in a city that's extremely overstimulated and in an industry that is very critical. It's really important to have a space that makes you feel comfortable and safe. So I think all of those things helped me psychologically and helped me start, I started to thrive. I wasn't just surviving, I was thriving. And I think that that's important. I think that it's a step that some actors try to jump over, that they don't want to have a day job because they're too busy trying to get work as an actor. But when, if you're desperate, you bring desperate into the room when you're auditioning. Yeah, I don't know how you could not. I mean, at the end of the day, your bills have to get paid. So I'm not sure how you could not have a day job if you're Something you need something, unless your parents are paying those bills, which you know that has to end at some point. At a certain age, that <laughs> that doesn't happen anymore. Right. But you've built your career, and you're a working actor, and you are making your bills through acting. 
I am, yeah. Through acting, through commercials, through the regional theater musical gigs that I have booked, through my solo show, Smoky Town, that I will be doing upcoming in Chicago in April. Oh, let's talk about that. A solo show is such a smart thing because it really fills the gaps in between, doesn't it? Yeah, well, I actually built it during those two years when I was first in New York because I was trying to create work for myself. And I developed it, uh, yeah, during that time. And it's continued to give back to me and it's continuing to grow and develop. And um, yeah, it's called Smoky Town, the Songs of Smokey Robinson. I wrote it originally as a, uh, a 60th birthday gift to my father. Oh. And the reason was because uh, Smokey Robinson is my dad's all time favorite singer and artist. And so I wrote a show celebrating Smokey Robinson's songwriting canon. Wow. I love that it's for dad. We love your dad. <laughs> I know. He's really doing the shout outs today. <laughs> shout out to dad. But I mean, he's been a great champion of you. And he's clearly part of the reason that you have been as successful as you have. Yeah, both he and my mom, for sure. I mean, they're very tough love. And, you know, every day before I left for high school, my dad would yell, fight! Like, and I once told a friend that story, and she was like, oh, my God, she clutched her pearls. Like, oh, my God, that's terrible. I mean, some people have such a negative response to that, like, tough, go out there and, you know, slay and <laughs> go out there and fight. Um, but that was, that's kind of, that go out there and fight is is the it, it resonates with me and it works for me. And that's, I think you need that kind of in an industry that is so, so hard. Yes. You know, you, you I, I'm both very sensitive and very much a fighter. And I think you need both of those to be an artist. Yes, you do. And you're also an activist. How did you become yes. an activist? Did you grow up as an activist or did it evolve slowly or? Well, I, I only recently started sort of claiming that I think I've always been one and feeling more that it's a part of my artist statement. So I'm uh, aligning with that more and more this year. Um, I, you know, I went to a, I went to a, an all girls Catholic high school and our senior theology class, ironically enough, was women's contemporary issues. It was a very progressive uh, high school. And I learned about like, it was essentially a women's studies class which was so cool. We deconstructed Little Mermaid and how it was insane that Ariel literally loses her voice for a man. And it was inspiring. So I went on into college. I studied musical theater and gender studies and have always been a, a huge activist and feminist and, and, and more recently committed to art for social change and women's advocacy in the theater. And I think the 2016 election has what really has, has, has woke me up again as it did so many of us. There was a part of me that the activist in me, although never really has ever gone away, I think we all became a little more complacent during those Obama years. And um, I, it's sort of been resurrected. And in doing so, I co-founded Ring of Keys, which is the national network that you mentioned. Uh, it's a national network for queer women and trans and gender non-conforming artists working in musical theater. My co-founder and I, we created that uh, let's see, I guess like a year after the election. And we had met and both felt very isolated as well. We, we talked about how, what it's like to be a lesbian in musical theater. And it's a very isolating experience. A lot of the times you're often the only queer woman in, in a, in a musical. Um, I worked in Chicago for eight years before I met another lesbian in a musical, another lesbian actress, I should say. Really? Um, and that lesbian actress was the woman who's now my girlfriend. So it, and it was, it's just really profound and kind of phenomenal and weird that that's, that we're so alone. And so we kind of decided we wanted to create a, a community for those of us that were feeling isolated. And we launched Ring of Keys in January my co-founder and I, that is, we launched in January and we have over 175 members, I think. Well, wow. And there's members from all over the, including London and Canada and um, the intent being community and visibility. And we serve as a hiring resource through our member directory, which is on our website at ringofkeys.org. Um, anyone that is looking to hire artists that self-identify um, as queer by 
non-binary, trans, lesbian, they can do so by checking them out on our website. So do you, when you say hiring, you find theater companies that are specific to gender issues or what? Yeah, yeah. So as of now, it's a, it's a member directory that exists that anyone can utilize as a, as a resource. Um, if they're looking to say they're looking for a trans a woman of color in their 30s, they could go to our website and utilize, a casting director could utilize our website. Or um, it also serves as a, a network networking tool for those within the, the ring, as we say. Right. If you're a lighting designer and you're wanting to hire an assistant, you want to hire within the queer community, you, you have a resource to be like, oh, I'm just going to check our own directory to see who I, who I could work with who I could hire. Fabulous. So, so you find these opportunities through the people that are in the community and they post? Like, how do you find somebody as... Outreach-wise? Yes. Um, we have kind of kind of been word of mouth in terms of uh, our members. We call our members keys. And uh, those that have become keys uh, has been very word of mouth through somebody they know they want to be part of our network. And um, we do a lot in terms of outreach and we hold monthly meetups. I think as we continue to grow and as we continue to develop into 2019, we're looking to get our 501c3 status and have a little more funding and opportunities for more programming. Well, that's wonderful. What a great seed that you've planted. It's a very valuable resource for a lot of people. Yeah, building a community is a very important, uh, that's been a real theme of mine throughout the podcast that I've done so far is talking about the community and how we all support each other. That's just Absolutely. the lovely thing about this roving band of gypsies is that. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. I think being a community organizer is now a title I could call myself because of Ring of Keys. And there, we crave community, especially in a city like New York that can feel very cold and very distant, despite there being millions and millions of people around us. And I think a lot of our members are really benefiting and, and procuring jobs from their relationships. Because, you know, at the end of the day, I, I, I'm kind of trying to stress this with our younger, early career artists in our network that like 90% of the work is like from you, you, you get because of who you know. And it's that you that happens from like naturally organically building relationships and engaging with other people. So do you mean you often get your work or the opportunity to audition through other actors, you know, or through an agent, you know, or through a casting director, you know, um, I think the way in which work begets work, I think somebody knows you or they know your work. And so they want to work with you again. I think it's in that sense where it helps you get a foot in the door sometimes too, of just getting an appointment for an audition because you've worked with that director before. So that helps you get in the room. It's some sort of something to grasp onto. And you really can't, if, if you're just staying at home and not building relationships and not working, you're kind of just stuck, I would think. Right. I always say you can get a lot more work anywhere than inside your apartment. <laughs> well, that's true, I guess. <laughs> Well, Andrea, it has just been an absolute joy talking to you. And if, unfortunately, we are at our time, but um, I am just so proud of you. And to see that I, before I, I sign off, I just want to sort of emphasize, basically, it was a three-year curve for you. In the third year, you started getting work, and then mm -hmm. you started weaning off your day job. Is that correct? Yeah. At year three is when I finally had a foundation because of the day job. And then you started to grow and to, to increase your credits. Correct. Yeah. So I think that's good for actors to hear because sometimes who knows if you quit 10 feet before the finish line and know that other people have had a journey as well. Yeah, 100%. So I thank you for sharing your journey. I will let you back to your wonderful exploration of Fun Home. I wish you all the best in the performances. And I look forward to seeing you when you're back in New York. Well, thank you. I so appreciate you talking to me and inviting me to be on your show. My pleasure. We have been speaking with Andrea Prestonario, and you are listening to The Craft and Biz of Acting. I'm your host, Joyce Story, and until next time, break a leg. 
Thanks for tuning in to the craft and biz of acting. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. And while you're at it, please leave us a rating and a review and share our show with your friends. We're building a supportive and educational community, and we want you to be a part of it. Tune in every week for more helpful insights and tools for honing your craft and booking your next gig. Until next time, break a leg.